All right, so we've got, <clears throat> at this point, we've really talked about intramolecular forces. Okay, so these are, uh, these are forces of attraction, and really what, what I'm going to call this is bonding. Okay, I'm going to call, oop, a little too big here. There we go. All right, uh, it's really bonding, all right, that we've talked about to this point, okay? So intramolecular forces uh, are, examples of this stuff are like ionic bonds, covalent bonds, all right, metallic bonding. All right, these are all things that are inside a compound or molecule. All right, that's all that stuff is inside, so intra, internal, okay, internal. So these are super strong, right? Ionic bonding, covalent bonding, metallic bonding, they're all very strong in terms of a comparison to in, in comparison to the intermolecular forces we're going to talk about. Okay, so these are all inside a compound or molecule. They're all in comparison. They're all very strong. In comparison to the inter okay molecular forces. All right, so at this point, the only types of uh, stuff we've been talking about is intra, okay, internal, right, inside substance, inside our ionic compound, inside a, uh, you know, a metal, okay, far stronger than the forces we'll talk about today, okay, all right, far stronger, all right, so <clears throat> intra is internal. Okay, internal. All right. So intermolecular. All right. All right. Intermolecular is very different. So like an inner state connects different states together. All right. An intermolecular force is is attraction between different molecules. Okay. Separate molecules, all right? So this is, and these are literally just forces of attraction. Forces of attraction between substances. Okay, so we're talking like molecule to molecule attraction. Molecule to molecule attraction. Molecule to molecule attraction. So they're relatively weak overall. Right, they're relatively weak because they're molecule to molecule. All right, breaking a covalent bond is far different from separating one molecule from another one. Okay. All right. So we're not talking about, you know, uh, separating hydrogen from oxygen inside a water molecule. Okay. So if I were to differentiate these two, like, if I draw. Right, H2O, we know what H2O looks like, right? Our Lewis dot structure for water, right? Okay. Those covalent bonds right there, those are covalent bonds, right? Those are intramolecular. 
All right, those are intramolecular. Let's see. Okay, but you guys know that water molecules are attracted to other water molecules, right? Okay, you guys have learned about that. What type of attraction uh, is present between water molecules? As remember, you guys should know this from biology. It's like probably the most important uh, intermolecular force that you didn't, you didn't even know it was an intermolecular force at the time. Hold your DNA together. Oh my gosh, all that stuff. Like the two strands of DNA. What? Hydrogen bonding. Yeah, that's a type of intermolecular inter force. Hydrogen bonding, yeah. Okay, that's just the attraction between one strand of DNA to the other. Okay? I know it says bonding, but it's not a bond. It's just an attraction. Okay? The word bond is misleading. All right, so... The attraction, I'm not even drawing a line there, I'm just drawing like, right, if that, that's another water molecule. <clears throat> that H bond equals intermolecular. That guy's intermolecular. All right, so that's the attraction between molecules, All right? So in, uh, intra is inside the molecule, inside the molecule. Inter is between two separate molecules, All right? That's an important distinction, okay? And this is the whole reason why we've been trying to identify whether or not things are polar or not polar, because that ultimately determines the type of intermolecular forces can occur between substances. Okay? <clears throat> Alright, so that's the difference. Inter, inter, inter right, between molecules, right, intra is internal inside the molecule. So ionic bonding, metallic bonding, covalent bonding, those are all internal. Alright, and intramolecular. All right. So when a substance boils or melts or something like that, okay, when a substance boils or melts or anything like that, what do you think is being broken? Intramolecular forces or intermolecular forces? So like when water, when you boil water, Right? When you boil water, it goes from liquid water to gas. Is it still water? Oh, yeah, it is. Yes, it is. That's a huge misconception. I don't get why that happens. Okay? Water, like as a solid outside right now, right? Okay? When you melt it, you overcome some of the intermolecular forces and the water molecules start to move around. And when you boil it and it goes from a liquid to a gas, it's still H2O bonded together. But it's just not a liquid anymore, it's gas. Yeah. No, it just gets frozen in uh, place. We'll talk about what that means. Like, solid doesn't do uh, molecules move in a solid? Not really. They only vibrate, right? Like your desk is not fluid, okay? But we can melt that substance down, right? Because it's just a solid at room temperature, okay? The ice out outside right now is a solid, and it's just frozen in like a, uh, a crystal like that because the molecules are attracted to each other enough at that point where they... They just stop moving, right? They're stuck in place, okay? Until you provide enough energy, then the molecules can start moving around again because they overcome, because they get, actually, they get stuck in their hydrogen bonding formation. That's why water expands when it contracts, or expands when it freezes. Little pockets of air develop there between the different water molecules. That's why it expands and stuff, but which is 
really, really super unique and it's super important for us. Could you imagine if water uh, actually contracted like every other substance when it froze? Same amount of mass, smaller volume. What happens to density? It increases, right? As the density of a substance increases, it would sink, okay? That's why ice floats. It's less dense than the water you have in it, right? So if the ice was more dense and it sunk to the bottom, what do you think would happen to every lake? Or the ocean, for that matter? Freeze from the bottom up. That'd be a problem for the fish. <laughs> right? Okay, that would be a major problem. The fish right now are cool, man. They like the top of lake freezes. It's all good. They can hang out down the bottom, swim around still. Froze from the bottom up. Oh, yikes. What? Well, and until eventually the whole thing froze. Then there's you know, no more fish. What? I'm sorry. Freezes from the lake, freezes from the bottom. No, not at all. The top, uh, the top few inches, and as it as the lake freezes, it acts as uh, insulation. Yeah. So, because otherwise, the water that's at so the top would freeze and sink to the bottom, freeze and sink to the bottom, and slowly fill up with ice, and then that would be it, right? So, right. But ultimately, right. The deal here is intermolecular forces are what break when you overcome right, when you boil something from liquid to a gas. That's what over that's what over seeing overcome. Okay, so changes of state. are impacted by, I can abbreviate this as IMF, IMFs, okay? You'll see that abbreviated. Intermolecular forces, okay, IMFs. So melting point, boiling point, and other physical properties Second. Okay, so so changes of state are impacted by IMFs. Okay, so things like melting point, boiling point, and other physical properties are determined by the amount of IMFs in the substance. Okay, so the more intermolecular forces, the more attraction that the molecules have to each other. Okay. That is going to impact the type of boiling point, okay? How high it is, right? Or how low it is, okay? The more attraction between molecules, the higher the boiling point. Water is a super unique substance. Lots of attraction between molecules. Very high boiling point for a substance that small, okay? For a substance that small, that low molecular weight, okay? So that's why it's very, very unique. There are other substances that are very much like it that don't have the same intermolecular forces in it. Extremely low melting points and boiling points. Okay? Things like that. All right. So we're going to talk about the three different types of intermolecular forces and the effects they have on the physical properties of a substance. Okay? So we'll start with the weakest and we'll work to the strongest. All right. So are we good though between inter and intra? One's inside, one is between molecules on the outside. Okay. All right. So 
three different types of intermolecular forces. First type is London dispersion forces. Uh, these are also called van der Waal forces. And London dispersion forces, also known as van der Waal forces, you'll hear those as well. Okay, so uh, all substances have these. Have this force. Because it depends on mass. Depends on mass of the substance. It depends on mass of the substance. Okay, but I will say here, all substances have this, but one thing that I would say is nonpolar molecules. This is the only IMF they have. Okay. Nonpolar molecules, this is the only only intermolecular force present in a nonpolar molecule. Okay, because it's dependent on mass. So every molecule has this force in it, but with other the other forces are so much stronger that they play they're far more important. But a nonpolar molecule, because this is the only force in there. All right, uh, this is this is the only one they have. Okay, polar molecules have the other forces present, usually. Okay, all right. So, and all this is is basically the uh, the attraction, right? When you can imagine, um, well, maybe I'll describe this first here. So, it is the attraction. Between induced dipole moments, of molecules talk about what that. By that. All right, remember what is a dipole moment? Yeah. First partial positive and Yeah. Okay, so dipole moment, we have a partial positive and a partial negative that is present. Hey, great. What does it mean to induce something? <laughs> oh, you can put, yeah, so you you place them into a coma. I was thinking about, like, child, right, childbirth, right? People get induced, right? Labor gets induced, so they make it happen. Okay? Well, this is what happens. If you can imagine there are two nonpolar molecules. Okay, nonpolar, right? It means there's not a dipole moment in them right now because they're nonpolar. So there's not a partial positive side, there's not a partial negative side. But what happens when you move these molecules closer and closer together? As they get closer to one another, right, what is on the outside of the molecule? On the outside of a molecule, 
you make it as simple as what's on the outside of an atom? Electrons, right? You're surrounded by electrons, right? As two electron clouds get close together, what do you guys know about like charges? They repel one another, right? So all of a sudden, you have unequal distribution of electrons now. And all of a sudden, one side of that molecule became partially positive, one side of the molecule became partially negative, just like that. Okay? So as the molecules come close together, you get the induction of a partial positive and a partial negative for a split second. Okay? For a very split second. All right? So this means like, right, to create... Right, so attraction, attraction between induced dipole moments of molecules. So, so maybe we'll describe this a little bit more and say like as nonpolar molecules come close to one another. I'll say a temporary dipole moment occurs. So you get a temporary dipole moment, so you get a small amount of attraction out of that. Yeah. So electrons repel, another, repel each other, right? So all of a sudden, you get part of that molecule, the electrons get pushed to one side, right? So as the electrons move to one side, that side becomes negative, and the other side is positive, right? So that affects the other squishier molecules around it, too, to make that positive negative happen all over the place, right? It's kind of a wave that's passing continually through the, the substance, right? But you can also imagine that the bigger, fatter, squishier the molecule, the easier it is to make a dipole moment, right? Because the electrons aren't held on real tight. You can smush them around a little bit easier, okay? So the larger the force, like the larger the mass, the, the stronger the uh, London dispersion force, okay? So... Larger the mass, the larger the LDF. Larger the mass, the larger the LDF. Okay, so for example here, right, we can look at a couple substances here. Let's take a look at the halogens. Right, fluorine gas. Fluorine gas. Bromine gas. Iodine. Oops, there we go. Right, our halogens there. They're all diatomic molecules. All right, they're all diatomic molecules. So you can see them up there on the periodic table. Right, you can see them on the periodic table. So what does red up on the periodic table mean? See how some of the elements are red, some are blue. There's only a couple that are blue, and then some are uh, black. Well, the rest are all black. Any ideas? 
about what that's telling us? Yeah. Red means it's a gas, yeah. What do you think blue means? Liquid. And black means that it's a solid. Okay? So at room temperature, all the elements up there that are in red are all gases. Okay? Uh, those are all, all the, the clear ones, I'm not sure what's up with 43, but all the clear ones there are uh, uh, non, uh, like they're man-made elements. Okay. So, if you look at those ones up there, so if we look at the halogens, notice the halogens there, all right, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all right, what happens as we move down the periodic table there? Yeah, Sebastian? Yeah, it's changed from gas to a liquid to solid. What happens to our molar mass as we move down the periodic table from chlorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine? It increases. Molar mass increases. So the molecules become bigger and fattier and squishier and more easily dipole moments are induced. Okay? So the more dipole moments you can make, the more attraction you have. What's up? Wait, so all of, all of those have the LDFs? Oh, yeah. Everything that has mass, which is every molecule, has LDFs in it, no matter what. Okay? So, increasing mass, right? And it all depends on molar mass. It's just easy to do it that way. And increasing molar mass, right? So as you go that way, we go from a gas. We have a gas. A liquid. Right? A solid. So much intermolecular force, right? Increasing molar mass. Increasing one in dispersion force. Yeah. But um, like when you said like they all have the London dispersion force, like, but the the like at, the elements themselves don't have it, right? Because that's how I'm just saying like. Oh uh, well, these are not right. F two Cl two Br. Those are they're diatomic molecules, right? They're diatomic elements, so they always exist as F two. So, and you can also imagine like. Uh, we'll take a look also at like neon, argon, krypton, right? Those are gases just as they're atoms alone. Yeah, right? There are intramolecular forces present, sure. Between, between, the, the, between those two elements, so when you push that, like, as to the as one molecule? Yes. But we're talking about a bunch of F2 molecules, oh. right? Interacting with one another. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Just a lowercase cursor L. That's all it is. Because <laughs> if I were to put if I would put this down, you know, what is that? I don't know. So that's why I kind of put the L like that. You know what I'm saying? Because otherwise it's like, you know, you might not necessarily know what that is. It'd be like a, a single line. What is that, a one in, in brackets? I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Okay, so everything that has mass has London dispersion forces. Okay? Bigger, heavier, fattier, squishier molecules, the more London dispersion forces there are. Okay. All right. Next on the docket is number two. Okay, these are dipole dipole interaction. I'll just say attraction. OK, 
Okay, so all polar molecules have this attraction. You have to be polar to have a dipole-dipole attraction. Right? Not being, if you're nonpolar, you only have London dispersion. You cannot be dipole dipole. Right? All this is is the attraction between polar molecules. Right? Molecules have a partial positive side, partial negative side. They can be attracted to another molecule with partial positive and partial negative. Right? That's a dipole. Dipole attraction. Right? There's a scale of attraction here as well. Right? The more polar the molecule, the stronger the attraction. Okay? The more polar the molecule, the stronger the attraction between each other. It doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, I just kind of show it as it's not a bond. That's what I'm trying to make sure we I'm clear on. That's why I'm not drawing like lines or anything. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just an attraction, like two magnets attracted to one another. Okay. So more more polar the molecule, the stronger the the dipole dipole attraction. Okay, there are different degrees of polarity, right? You can be some molecules are really, really polar. These are very asymmetrical. Other molecules are not quite as polar, right? Okay, so there you go. Have to be polar to have that attraction. Do polar molecules still have one dispersion forces? They do, okay, because they have mass, and they have mass, but it's not nearly as important as a dipole-dipole attraction. That's going to really determine all their properties, okay? All right, third and final one. Hydrogen bonding. It is still just an attraction. It is not a bond. Okay, it is not a bond. It's just a very special attraction. That's why it's given a special name. Okay, of hydrogen bonding. It is not a bond. Okay, it's just an attraction. Okay, so this one's kind of got a little bit longer def definition here, all right? Attraction between a partially positive hydrogen that is attached to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So it's attraction between the partial positive hydrogen that is attracted to that is attached to a fluorine oxygen nitrogen of the partial negative fluorine oxygen nitrogen of a different molecule. Okay, so we'll draw that out here a little bit. Just kind of give you a couple pictures of what that looks like. All right, so hydrogen has to be attached to phone. 
Okay, if, it, if you're not attached to phone, that hydrogen will not be partially positive enough to do hydrogen bonding. Okay, it has to be attached to a fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Okay, so for example, like, like NH3 molecule, right? That hydrogen there is partially positive enough to be attracted to, say, the nitrogen of another. That guy's partially negative enough, right? That's our hydrogen mod. Okay, because H, that hydrogen is attached to nitrogen. Oh, it's attracted to the partial negative of another not of of a nitrogen. Okay. That works. Or like with water. Partial positive hydrogen, partial negative oxygen, there's a hydrogen bond. So just because you see hydrogen in a molecule does not mean that it can do hydrogen bonding. Okay. Gasoline cannot do hydrogen bonding. What's up? Is the oxygen partial negative because it takes the electron from the hydrogens? Now remember electronegativity, right? If we look inside that molecule, right? Okay, oxygen is right next to fluorine, right? So it's going to hog these electrons. So turning this, this is a polar bond, right? So one end is partially negative and the other end is partially positive. Okay. So, because notice, the guys who are partially negative are the ones that are right by fluorine or fluorine itself, right? F-O and N. Okay. Hydrogen is the partially positive guy. And that's why they have to be attached to that because there's a big enough difference in electronegativity that hydrogen is really, really positive. Okay? And the oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine are really, really negative. So there's going to be a strong attraction there. Yeah. Uh, that might be true as well, but the size of it impacts that as well. Okay? So it the fact that nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine are really small in comparison impacts that as well. And these are just these are just values, right? They're not, you know, totally end all be all like components. And also depends like what they're attached to. I mean, I know these are supposedly the same, but the size of that is is a huge impact as well. Yep. Uh, to be honest with you, I think they've fallen off over the years. That's how old that thing is. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So what we want to do here, pull out bonding worksheet number three, numero dos. Numero dos. Numero tres. Bonding worksheet number three. Pull that guy out. <laughs> We're going to turn that last column of hybridization into IMFs. I'm going to do this on the fly because all the copiers are broken in the building, so I can make a, a nice fresh one. So, switch this up a little bit. Improv. <laughs> all right, so with bonding worksheet number three, change that last column over there, right, from hybridization 
to IMF, intermolecular force. <coughs> so what we want to do is we want to identify the intermolecular force present in each molecule. Okay. So you need to kind of make a little bit of a, uh, you know, there's basically kind of a couple questions you need to ask, okay, as we go through this. So like a little flow chart. So you got your molecule, right? You go down. Everybody has LDF, right? Everybody's got LDF, no matter what. And then the question you got to ask is, is it polar or is it nonpolar, right? If it's nonpolar, then we're done, right? Only LDFs are present. Only London dispersion forces. And you're done. Okay, so if it's polar, you could be dipole dipole. Right? It could be dipole dipole. Then you gotta ask, okay, well. H is with bone. Or no. Right? So your H is with bone. So if that's the case, then you've got hydrogen Otherwise, it's only dipole dipole. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, um, if you have hydrogen bonding, is that completely separate from LDF or like the way your flow chart is? Like this LDF become hydrogen bonding or something? No, you have all three. Okay. Everybody's got LDF, right? And then as you go, it's like, okay, I have LDF. If I'm polar, I could have dipole dipole as well. If I got H's attached to foam, then I have hydrogen bonding too. Okay. So I shouldn't say only dipole dipole, I should say dipole dipole. And LDF, right? Like those bolts are present then, All right? Something like that. So that's what you gotta kind of ask yourself, right? So when you go through this, if I look at CH four here, what's that? Only LDF, yeah. It's only one in dispersion force, right? Because this guy's nonpolar, right? So there's only LDFs in there. But it's got hydrogens. It's not polar. Okay, are any of the hydrogens attached to F O or N? No, so it can't be hydrogen bonding. Right? Second one on the list, H two O. Right, this guy's this guy's polar. So so it's got all three, right? It's got LDF, it's got dipole dipole. And it's got hydrogen bonding. I could also ask, say, like, okay, here's this molecule. What's the strongest intermolecular force in it? Hydrogen bonding. Right. Yeah. Right. So you should know that all three are there, but you should also be able to be like, ah, the strongest one is this one. Or if it's only LDF dipole dipole, dipole dipoles. Okay. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make sure if I wasn't clear on that, as we were going through these, right? Weakest at the top, strongest at the bottom. Whoa. 